welcome. We have made it to week 14, and our topic this week is hypothesis testing. You know, I had a little hypothesis about test about the class for this week, which was that if the weather is too bad, then a lot of students won't show up. Uh, and I also had a hypothesis that said that in the later parts of April, we shouldn't have any snow. And yet I was, I was right about one of those and wrong about the other ones. Here we are with snow at the later part of April. Well, those I, I described as a hypothesis, uh, but that's not really what we're going to be talking about with an introduction to hypothesis testing. And in fact, the hypothesis testing that we will be doing would follow this example. So hypothesis testing is an inferential statistical method that uses sample data to evaluate assumptions about a population parameter. Now I know that's a, that's a mouthful. That's a lot to try to take in all at one point. So let's break that down and explore the meaning of each of those parts of that rather complicated paragraph. So number one, hypothesis testing is a statistical method. Now what that means is it's a technique. And I'm going to break it down into five steps for you. The book also breaks down hypothesis testing into five steps. And you'll notice that my five steps are slightly different than the five steps from the book. You will probably notice that they are very similar, but I have them arranged in just a slight, slightly different way. I've taught out of a textbook that uses six steps. I even saw one that uses seven steps. But here's the secret. No matter how many steps the process is broken down into, it's always the same steps. So you will see five steps pretty commonly. Those five steps will differ between one textbook and another, but it's always the same five steps or multiple steps to getting to an answer. So this is a statistical technique which we use to make an inference or an educated guess. Uh, an inference is saying, here's what we think is most likely to occur, or what the probability suggests is the most likely outcome. So making an inference, an educated guess, using sample data, and specifically that will be the mean of the sample that we tested. I'll also show you how to do this with proportions later on. About a population parameter, that will be the mean of the population. So we have a sample statistic, and we have a population parameter. Evaluate the assumption of whether the sample mean and the population mean are the same. This is a process that we call inferential statistics. Determining the likelihood that the sample mean, which I'll either abbreviate as capital M or as X bar, represents the population data which I'll represent as a mu, which is a Greek letter M, from which the sample was drawn. You know, this makes sense. When you think about a population, any sample drawn from that population should have the characteristics of the population. If we have a group of college-age males, and we know that the average height of American college-age males is five foot, 10 inches tall, then if we draw a sample of college aged males, we would expect that their height would be 5 feet 10 inches tall. What is true of the population should be true of any sample drawn from the population. They should not differ. On the other hand, we know that because of random chance, they will differ somewhat or slightly, but that's just random error. There's no truly significant difference between the sample mean and the population mean. So let me explain this idea, chance versus effect, using an example with polar bears. We know something about polar bears, and that is that polar bears love to walk. They will walk long distances, sometimes hundreds of miles. And we watch a National Geographic show that tells us that on the average, polar bears will walk 20 miles in a single day, 100 miles per week. And we get really curious about that. We want to do some inferential statistics using these ideas. 
We start with a population of polar bears that walk 100 miles per week. And we're going to draw some samples from this population. We're going to draw a first sample. Given that it's drawn from a population that walks 100 miles per week, how far do you think this sample of polar bears is going to walk in a week? Well, the most likely outcome would be 100 miles per week, because the sample is drawn from a population that walks 100 miles per week. And if we draw a second sample, how far will they walk in a week? Our best guess, 100 miles per week. And if we draw a third sample, how far will they walk in a given week? Anytime we're drawing a sample from a population with a mean of 100, we expect the sample mean will also be 100. Now I've done something that uh, I would recommend you not to do. I've divided my three samples into an experimental group and two control groups. You should never have two control groups in an experiment, but you're going to see why I did that very unusual thing with these two control groups in a moment. It's actually a teaching example. So not good research design, but it's going to illustrate a point about similarities and differences. We have an experimental group that is going to receive a treatment of some kind. Now, in research design, what we would then do is we would go to the literature. We would do a literature review, and we'd find something that we could apply with the polar bears that we are studying. And so we go to a journal, and we discover this about whales. We read the scientific journal article in which studies show that whales who were given caffeine swim 48% further than similar whales with no caffeine. And this gets us to thinking. I wonder if the same thing would be true for polar bears. There's a gap in the literature, and we're going to fill that by doing our own research project. We're going to give polar bears caffeine and see if that makes them walk further. And so we do. We give one group of polar bears caffeine, and then we examine both our experimental group and our control groups. Let's start with the first control group, which is actually group number two. We find that after this study, where, where these polar bears did not get any caffeine, that those polar bears walk, on average, 100 miles per week. And my question for you is this. Does this sample mean of 100 represent the population mean? What do I mean by represent? Does this sample look like the population? Well, with a mean of 100, drawn from a population with a mean of 100, this sample beautifully represents the population. We would say they are the same. But let's look at that second control group. This is also a group of polar bears that did not receive any caffeine, and when we measure them after the study, we find they walk on average 104 miles per week. Well, that's different than the population. It's different by four miles per week. So now we've got to ask ourselves, is this difference of four miles per week more likely due to random chance, or is there some kind of an effect? These polar bears didn't receive any caffeine, and yet they walked a little bit further. This is an example of random error. This control group is probably exactly the same as they were at the beginning. There's just some randomness. One polar bear walked a little bit further. This adds some error to our data. But we're going to say that although it is 104 and 100, that these two numbers are really the same. Well, the sample well represents the population. There's a small difference, but not enough to, to um, be accounted for by any real effect. It's just random error. But now we look at our experimental group. And we find that these polar bears, which were given caffeine, walk 150 miles per week. Now we have to ask the same question about which is more likely. Is it more likely that our sample, with a mean of 150 miles per week, represents a population with a mean of 100, or is it more likely that our sample with a mean of 150 represents a different population 
a population of caffeinated polar bears that walks, well, if it's a 48% improvement, we would expect uh, an average of 148 miles per week. Does that number, 150, better represent the population from which it was drawn, 100, or a different population with a mean of 150? There are two hypotheses at work here. The first one is called the null hypothesis. We call that H sub zero, colon. It says mu equals 100. And the way that we would understand that in words is we would say that sample one, our experimental group, represents a population with a mean of 100. But we would also offer an alternative to that null hypothesis. We'll call it an alternative hypothesis. And that is that sample one does not represent a population with a mean of 100 of H sub one colon mu does not equal 100. Our sample does not represent a population with a mean of 100. And we're also willing to say, now that we've done the experiment, it better represents a different population, one that is defined by an effect of the caffeine. In other words, these polar bears walked further as the result of drinking caffeine. So when we do hypothesis testing, the question is, which hypothesis do we test? We do not start with the hypothesis that we want to prove or the one that we wish was right. We start with a null hypothesis that says there's no difference between the sample mean and the population mean. The differences that we may observe, like the difference between 104 and 100, are due to chance. And we will write this hypothesis as H sub zero. Our alternative is the alternative hypothesis that the sample mean is different from the population mean, that those differences are due to an effect, and we would write this as H sub one. You will also see it written as H sub A for alternative hypothesis. Either one of those notations is fine and acceptable. However, you will always write the null hypothesis as H sub zero. So to further illustrate this idea, I want to use a, a, a scientific example drawn from the journal of Hannah and Barbera. It's the wisdom of Scooby-Doo. So if you've ever watched Scooby-Doo, you know it follows a fairly predictable pattern. The gang is traveling in their mystery van and it breaks down in front of an old amusement park or maybe a haunted mansion. And so they go inside to investigate, maybe looking for a phone so they could call to get someone to come and fix the flat tire on the van. Well, in this haunted mansion, they encounter all kinds of strange occurrences. And there's one of two explanations that they could offer for these occurrences. Option number one is that there are no ghosts and something is afoot. Option number two, there are ghosts. And ghosts explain all of the odd phenomena that they are experiencing. Well, which of these is the better explanation? Which is the one that we should start with as our default? And it really matters which one we begin with. Because if we begin with a, with a hypothesis that says that something is the case or is true, well, then we start looking for evidence to support a conclusion that we've already drawn. And so anytime there's a strange noise or a light that blinks on and off or anything at all, whether it's just someone stumbling into some paint cans in the corner and creating a noise, we say, ah, it must be ghosts. But if you start with the hypothesis that there are no ghosts, you can begin to look at that evidence in a different way. And sure enough, once you've discovered the caretaker at that haunted mansion who has a financial benefit to gain by running everyone out so he can somehow claim ownership of the old mansion, if you already believe in ghosts, then that becomes a plausible explanation. But once the bad guy is unmasked, the ghost explanation is no longer required. 
It works without that assumption. So here is the wisdom of Scooby-Doo. All the real monsters in the world are human. And everything supernatural or otherworldly is just some jerk trying to scare you so they can make money. That's the wisdom of Scooby. Well, let's apply this in a slightly different way using babies in hypothesis testing. That in developed countries, the average newborn weighs 7.5 pounds, or 3.4 kilograms, with a range of 6 to 10.1 pounds, or 2.7 to 4.6 kilograms. So let's keep in mind that 7.5 number. That's going to be our population value, because this is what is true for uh, developed countries all over the world. So then you continue reading, and you discover this story that says, in Siberia, a woman gave birth to a 17-pound, one-ounce baby. True story. I read it on the internet. And in fact, it does come from a, a, a news source. So uh, this, this actually did happen. And there's a picture, so we know it has to be true. So we look at this example. And this gets you to thinking, is this unusual in Siberia? And you do a little more digging, and you find another statistic that tells you that in Siberia, the average baby weight is 11 pounds. Now, actually, I just made that up for this example, but let's assume this was true. So now we have a sample. It's the average baby weight in Siberia, 11 pounds, compared to the world average of 7.5. Does my Siberian sample mean represent the world population? We know it's different, but is it different because of random error or chance? Or is it different because there really is something different about Siberia? There's some kind of an effect. Well, that is what we're going to try to figure out in our next video.